So, uh, welcome everybody to the What's Next panel. I think uh, I'm Professor Ken Harper, and I'm the director of the Newhouse Center for Global Engagement, and a professor here in the Multimedia Photography and Design Department. I'm honored to be uh, joined on the stage with so many distinguished professionals and young students and uh, student, <laughs> and uh, really excited um, that we could bring together such great minds to talk about something so important. Um, that, you know, from my perspective, uh, what do you do about it, you know? I mean, I always, I always uh, hearken back to the fact that I'm, I'm a white guy from Indiana. You know, what do you do to participate in the world? How do you affect change from where you're sitting? I mean, I would probably start with, you should probably stand up. <laughs> and probably do something, physically, metaphorically, mentally. Uh, no one should accept the things that are happening in our world, but clearly we're distracted by you know, so many things. So I, I, uh, we're here to just to poke at that question. And I'd like to frame this uh, with the idea of there's no answer, there are answers. And it's an evolution. And we can't be afraid to try different things. And we can't be afraid to be an individual pushing forward. You know, we heard the powerful words of uh, the young girl, Vanna in, in Aleppo. And while we were, while Jen was reading her, her tweets, they got, some got deleted. I mean, who knows? I don't know, right? If this young girl can be so strong in the face of such unimaginable horror, how much stronger should we be, right? And I think this is, a, this is a moment of empowerment. It's not a moment of despair for us. I think it's a moment where we can, we can look at the people that are sitting up here and say, you know, you can be a public school teacher and affect 10,000 classrooms and half a million people and wow. That's amazing. You know, you can be a, a young student like Elijah here, you know, starting with Reporters Without Borders chapter. Uh, in fact, um, Lee, where are you at? Reporters Without Borders, come on up, come on up. I just want to kind of pre-populate uh, the first chair here uh, with uh, Lee Burke as a representative of Reporters Without Borders, and she's been gracious enough to come up and, and join us, join us uh, this afternoon uh, to help talk about what's next. Do I think what's next? Y'all are what's next. <laughs> We're in a place of education, right? Many of the people up here on the stage are, are well into rocking hard and trying to address the issues that plague society. And many of you are just starting your path. Some of you have had in the classroom, lucky enough to say, and I, I'm, I, I love talking about what a privilege you have to be able to take a moment and think about how you can participate in the world. And uh, you know, to kind of start off that conversation, you know, I want to I want to talk with uh, I just want to start with Elijah, you know, um, who's uh, founding the first uh, student chapter here, Reporters Without Borders, um, and uh, and of course Lee uh, as part of that conversation, you know. What is the future of journalism? You're the future of journalism. You've heard about all the difficulties, right? All the corporate media and all the things you have to push against or push through or go over or go under. You know, don't be satisfied with uh, one direction. Uh, your, your generation of folks are the folks that are going to take the mantle, right, and push it forward. So what, what do you think? What's your plans? What are you thinking of doing? I think um, as journalism moves forward, uh, we are getting away from that kind of very brief, very, here are the facts, let's uh, go about your day. Um, I think what we need to do now is we need to tell these stories. We need to really humanize these people um, in the way that they are. We look at reporting done by the New York Times uh, in their How the Middle East Came Apart. They chronicled a Syrian college student that could be any one of us in this room. He went to college and a civil war broke out on his doorstep. 
what we have to do is we have to make these connections. We have to show that we aren't, these, we aren't that far from these people. And we need to do that in a way that keeps journalists safe. We need to do that in a way that people can really get into, but not make the conversation shallow. And that's a hard thing to do. And I'm not necessarily sold on how we do it, but we need to have these conversations that allow people to connect and have deep, meaningful conversation. And as Reza said uh, many times, to unite, to show that we aren't so different. And I think that's, in a way, the future of journalism, but also to explain, to explain how and to show that this shouldn't happen again, or here are the ways that we can keep it from happening again. Lee? Well, and we're very excited that Syracuse is one of our newest chapters because um, you are the next generation. And press freedom, which is our main focus at Reporters Without Borders, is something that we kind of take for granted here in the United States. We don't, um, we're not the Vietnamese blogger who has their computer taken from them, confiscated, and things like that. We generally, until maybe the most recent elections, have not had uh, you know, credentials, things taken from, from journalists. So um, the importance of these chapters and the importance of working with uh, students is to remember that press freedom is something that we need to protect, we need to think about, and we need to support. And there are obviously a lot of ways where you can engage through press freedom organizations, not just Reporters Without Borders, but a lot of them because we're working together um, to make sure that we remember that it is, um, it is something that we hold very dear in this country, and we need to make sure that it remains around the world. So to kind of follow up with that, you know, we have uh, some really amazing people in here, including uh, Roy Gutman, who's a veteran, veteran journalist and has a, a deep amount of experience in, in reporting from uh, areas of conflict. Um, I know you're now you're based in Turkey and uh, you're really f forging your own path, which uh, I personally appreciate. Uh, what, what do you see, I mean, when you look at Elijah, <coughs> right, what do you see and what would you like to see, you know, from your perspective? Uh -oh. uh, first of all, can I just say, if this okay. is not out of place, that uh, I have to salute you guys for holding this conference. Uh, not just because we're dealing with, uh, you know, the media and our pluses and minuses and covering uh, this immense issue, but that you've got David and um, Bill and, uh, you know, the war crimes people on the same panel, <coughs> and that you're, I, I mean, I, don't, I haven't yet seen quite what the, what the mixture is, how we, <laughs> how we work together or, or whether we work together, uh, and I'd love to hear their views on it, but it just seems to me that um, uh, the war crimes issue is something that I happen to think is truly important, that where journalism really can make a difference and should make a difference, <coughs> and we have, to, we have to master ourselves the laws of armed conflict, understand what we're seeing when we're seeing a violation in front of our eyes, and we may not want to label it under the law, but we, we definitely need to recognize it because it's news. Uh, uh, crime is news domestically, and crime is news internationally, and massive crimes that are going on, as they're going on right now in Syria, uh, should be a much bigger news, uh, and it is not the bang-bang, it is not the destruction of buildings and the killing of people uh, uh, alone, it is the fact that this is done against the civilians who are protected people under international law, <coughs> and the violations of international law are war crimes. So we, th that is just my way of trying to bring those two together. Um, secondly, just to say that your point, your, your uh, phrasing <coughs> that uh, there are some things that, uh, that are not acceptable, that we should, uh, we should uh, go after those things that are not acceptable. Some things are acceptable, but some things are not acceptable. And what's going on right now there in Syria is one <laughs> falls in that category of not acceptable. Um, and what we do about it is, um, it, it's a question I was asked after the, after the Bosnia War. <coughs> and I never had really had an answer for, for the general public, except to say, if it's not acceptable, think of something uh, that you can do that's going to uh, affect it. And, it, and we all have our own different, uh, uh, you know, uh, paths to, uh, to uh, doing things in all our own lives and our own friends. <coughs> and if we really think about it, we might be able to figure out something we can do. So now what can we do? Um, let me <laughs> offer you my uh, uh, thing, and, and maybe uh, Elijah will uh, uh, have uh, something to contribute, but, uh, you know, or maybe somebody else will. Um, and my idea is that um, I, I, start, I have to start with myself. What do I know about the war in Syria? What do I not 
what, I, what do I not know? And even though I've been working on this story for four and a half years, I have to tell you there's a huge amount I do not know. Uh, and why is this? Uh, it's because we, I have no access. Um, b because I'd be sh not just shot at, but probably uh, beheaded if I, uh, if I went in at this particular time, uh, unless there's a ceasefire, unless there's some, some sort of protections. <clears throat> um, uh, there is a news blackout, basically, by the Assad regime to the great extent that they can uh, impose it. But then there's also social media and, and uh, incredibly enough access to a lot of people in Syria, maybe even in, in areas that I, I would not even think of going to, but I probably should. There's, there is a war that is a very strange kind of war. Uh, I would call this, in fact, and this reminds me of the Balkans, this is a war crime masquerading as a war. Uh, and it is an immense war crime. And so uh, uh, we have an obligation to try to, f to report what is happening on the ground to real people uh, who are the victims of this war crime. Though their stories are real stories. Uh, their stories um, might move uh, people to read about them if they are told. But we have, I think we've had a lack of imagination as, as journalists as to, as to how to get at those stories. So the idea I have it, it combines uh, um, the, the situation we're in, which is uh, one of a lot of ignorance, <coughs> um, uh, and the situation on the ground, which is we actually might have access to people, um, and, um, and, 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 and thirdly, I, th I think that the, the, the major news media are addicted to bang-bang coverage. You know, okay, the siege of Aleppo is on right now, so there is daily coverage of that. But you know, there was a period at the beginning of July when the siege actually began, and I happened to be doing a story on Aleppo and I wrote one of the first stories about how the siege was beginning, and I was like about three days ahead of my colleagues in the news media. And I was just, at one point, I, I didn't even have an outlet, because I'm a freelance and I, I have to sell every story. Uh, so I put it on my, my, my Facebook blog, um, and, and the 150 or 200 reporter friends who happened to be um, uh, uh, Facebook friends uh, all read it, and I, and I heard from them. Uh, thank you very much for, for giving us the day-to-day -day of Aleppo. But this is ridiculous. You you know, the, the major me news media should be following these developments before they actually uh, turn into uh, uh, massive uh, onslaughts. Uh, we should be there ahead of time before Daraya uh, collapses and surrenders. Uh, we should be reporting from the besieged areas. And th this is why I say it's a war crime masquerading as a war. The Syrian army's basic function in this war is to maintain besieged areas. They don't really fight. There's no morale there. They have to bring in outside militias to fight. But so let's just focus on what the Syrian army is doing in these in these siege areas. You know, 1.1 1 .1 million to 1.5 million, maybe even more people are under siege, living under siege. They cannot leave. They cannot enter. Food gets there only when uh, the government permits it. This is a shocking situation when you really define it like that. And we and 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 we know so little about it. So my idea is to try to take advantage of the fact. That, with their, that the Syrians are maybe the most literate people in the Middle East. Uh, they may not have a great journalistic tradition, uh, but they probably have a fledgling journalistic tradition, especially out after what they've been through. And find people in, let us say, the besieged areas. Uh, let us say, uh, even in ISIS-held areas. Uh, let's go to northern Syria and the area under the control, and that's a rather tight control of the Kurdish militia called the YPG. Um, let's go to places under government um, uh, control. Let's try to get a voice from each of these places, and to have, and maybe they can't write journalism, uh, that's to say, you know, the report of what happened today, but they might be be able to write a letter from that place and, and tell us what life is like in that place. And if it's well enough written, and if it's, and if it's moving enough, if it's, if it's a real story, uh, people might read it. And I, for example, uh, starting back, going back to myself, I would learn from it what the real situation is. And then knowing that from, from these five or 10 different, or 15 or 17, as it is, governorates uh, places, I might actually be able to have an overview of what the war is, who's really of doing what to whom and where is it going. So this would be a news agency. 
And the idea I have is uh, it would be in, an, we could call it the investigative news agency so that it doesn't have the uh, pre pretension to be a daily news agency <coughs> uh, that would provide um, content for major news media. Uh, now, uh, all of this is in existence in some form already. I have to be uh, quite honest, and certainly in the last panel, uh, uh, one of the fellows was talking about, uh, you know, the, <coughs> the, 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 uh, the Twitter connections um, and his own, what was it called, the um, instant reporting. Uh, instant reporting. <coughs> What's missing in all of this is the is the key factor in invest in real investigative reporting. In fact, in real news reporting, the key factor. And we all have, to, I hate to say it, the key factor is editors. <coughs> you know, unedited raw material that has not been verified, that's not been checked, that has not had to go through this, this vetting process uh, is very interesting. It's indicative, it might be great tips, but it is not, it, it doesn't qualify on the whole as news reporting. And so my idea is to insert an editing level <coughs> with professional editors who have to be paid, uh, to, who will uh, vet, drive the, uh, drive the product, uh, be in contact either directly or indirectly with uh, the reporters or, and, and they may not be reporters. They may be citizen journalists. They may be people just with higher degrees uh, who speak English or maybe who don't. But it is to get the voices of, uh, of, of Syrians <coughs> uh, and, and to somehow frame it into a news product that can be used and that will be used, and not just in this country, but uh, you know, in the major countries of Europe. Uh, I, I'm, I'm now in a f the stage of doing a feasibility study to see whether this is possible, <coughs> and I'll report back in a few months. But um, I, I, think it, I think it is doable. Well, clearly, you know, things need to be done. If we look at uh, different ways of gathering information, um, <coughs> Bill Wiley and, and David Crane, um, and how that happens in the reality of, of trying to gather that information, albeit, you know, be it from social media, or from folks smuggling it through, uh, you know, conflict uh, zone lines and borders. Um, you know, what's been your experience in trying to vet information, and is there a way to improve that? Is there? Are you? Where did you start when you began trying to sift through a lot of information, whether it be you know, papers coming in physically or uh, through uh, digital means? You know, wh where did it start and where is it now, as far as the ability to actually tackle it? Well, information comes at a group such as Bill and I are in uh, from many, many ways. Uh, amazingly, a lot of it is just open source information via the, uh, the Internet uh, and also by social media. Uh, so it can come in that way. It can come through, obviously, news links and RSS feeds. Uh, certainly, it comes in from uh, human beings uh, in and around Syria uh, also. Uh, the issue related to uh, corroborative evidence uh, or information, I want to say evidence, uh, is a real challenge. Uh, and we have a standard that uh, we're, we just don't put everything that's, that comes out of there as a, an event. Uh, it has to be uh, uh, verified before it goes on our crime-based matrix. How do you, what's the, what does that mean exactly? How what's do you verify it? Well, again, what you do is you uh, go to other, other sources uh, and uh, independent sources or sources that don't know each other and just find, you know, they're reporting the same thing or a like incident. Sometimes it, uh, it's not completely clear, but it, it, there's an incident in a location and someone's reporting uh, uh, over the airways that it's an incident takes place. Uh, but then someone else is coming out of, uh, out of Syria saying it took place, but it's not quite in that region. Uh, that's an issue uh, that we have to be careful of, and we, uh, we try to get maybe a third verification before it goes up on the crime-based matrix. But one of the issues that we are, uh, we are in inundated with is, is what I call, and, and uh, Jennifer and I just did an op-ed on this, came out yesterday on Syrac uh, Syracuse.com, called the Information Tsunami. Uh, when Bill and I started doing this a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, 
Uh, we just went out and did it the old-fashioned way. We went and talked to witnesses and uh, took statements and, and typed it up and they swore to it and we kept them c safe and they came into court and they said, here's what happened and we started proving our case. That's what we did in Yugoslavia and Rwanda and, and Sierra Leone. But then all of a sudden this thing called social media. I mean, let's, let's stop and think. When I left uh, the special court for Sierra Leone in West Africa in 2005, none of this existed. None of it. I mean, I remember coming home and my kids saying, uh, uh, Dad, uh, you want to listen to this song? And they handed me this thing called an MP3 player with a little dial on it. And I was absolutely blown away. I said, well, what happened to the CDs? And they go, well, they don't exist anymore. And I go, I, what planet am I on? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, things, things to happen. But now what we're finding, and, and Bill can certainly talk about this as well, is that the stuff that's coming out of Syria, 99.9% .9 of it, I'm just being using that as just a figure, it could even be higher than that, is that it's useless in court. I can't use it. As a former chief prosecutor, none of that stuff is evidence. It's just information that can be used for various things. Sometimes we might be able to turn it into criminal information which may lead to some evidence. But all these videos, all these pictures, all of that, though possibly could be used as maybe as what we call demonstrative evidence uh, for a trier of fact, really is not going to help me in court at all. So what at the end of the day is, is we've got these, uh, not just terabytes of information, I think it's called petrabytes, it's a million, it's a million terabytes? What was that? Petabyte. Petabyte. Which doesn't sound real good. <laughs> a, pe a petabyte. Okay. But the point is, is that uh, it's, uh, it's almost uh, unimaginable the bits of information that are coming out. And somewhere in that petabyte of information uh, is maybe a little needle that is, uh, uh, it's a needle in a haystack. There may be some evidence that we could use. Uh, we've got to find the paper. We've got to find the, the, the original piece of paper. We've got to find the guy that r signed the piece of paper. We've got to find the guy who can go into court and say, yes, that's my signature, and then we can move it into evidence. You know, those rules haven't changed, regardless of how much technology has gone. And by, by the way, I just pulled this out. Uh, this is the case against the uh, warring factions in Syria. Here's, that's it. Uh, that is just a memory stick with our logo on it, and uh, that is everything that we've ever done related to Syria since March of 2011. Now, we first started out in 2011, we had paper. I remember going to the State Department and handing them three reams of nice paper. But we can't do that anymore, so when I go and, and meet with uh, the Chief Prosecutor of the ICC or the uh, 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 a legal counsel to, at the UN or various countries, when I give them the work of the Syrian Accountability Project, uh, I give it to, this is what I give them. And they're almost disappointed. It's like, you haven't been doing very much, have you? <laughs> but that's everything. It's, the, it's, it's everything from March 11th, 2011 to the present. That's a crime-based matrix uh, of over 7,000 pages. Uh, that is a, uh, a conflict map uh, that is various other uh, pieces of evidence that can be used by uh, a future prosecutor someday. But that just shows you how much it's, it's changed. But I'm very concerned uh, about this new shift uh, of all this information coming out. Uh, and it can cloud an investigation. But at the end of the day, uh, if Bill Wiley and I are told five years from now, go prosecute whomever, we're still going to go back to paper and witnesses and verifiable photographs, what have you. That's why the Caesar report was so phenomenal because you know we don't get a lot of direct evidence in this business because either they're dead or the evidence is destroyed. But uh, the Caesar report, we call him Caesar, but it was put out, it was brought out by a, a young sergeant in the Syrian army who was a forensic photographer whose job was to take pictures of deceased. 
we all have them, all military police, all police have photographers who take pictures of deceased human beings. Well, they were coming through his particular office at 55 per day and they were stacked out in the parking lot. So he notified a friend who was a friend saying, you know, I can make, I can make copies of this and I'll smuggle them out in my shoe. And so for two years he did this and brought out 55,000 photographs. Of course, when you think 55,000 photographs, we're talking a memory stick. So it's not, uh, but it is the original high definition photos and uh, uh, documents which verify these photos so that, you know, I, when we went over to verify this because we, no one knew what we had, I was amazed at all of this. And at the end of the day, all our forensic teams whittled it all down and it was the stuff that he brought out uh, was, the, uh, was direct evidence of an industrialized killing machine by Assad and the destruction of just these three uh, uh, hospitals, or these, these detention facilities, about 11,000 human beings that were starved to death, tortured, and then killed. Uh, but we smuggled Caesar out. We were able to seize the actual photographs, get a chain of custody started, and put them in an evidence locker. So they are now in a country which uh, uh, has them, and uh, in an evidence locker uh, where it was signed into it in a chain of custody and it'll assign, be signed back out by, a, uh, uh, by that same uh, process so that a prosecutor can put that evidence into court. And then we can bring Caesar in and he can say, I took that photo, how do you know that you took that photo? Uh, that's my signature at the bottom of the photo and so you turn to the judge and go, I move that evidence 103 be put into evidence and but see all of these other photographs and 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 videos that uh, that are coming out in whatever that word is that uh, was said uh, just massive amounts of data that I you can't use it because I, I I can't find the guy that took the picture or I can't find a guy that can verify that that actually is a video that was taken of that particular incident see where I'm going with this and I I don't mean to be so uh, long-winded but we haven't talked about that today, and, and I think Roy had brought up, you know, how does media and war crimes investigations kind of mesh? And the answer is, it can be incredibly helpful and useful, but it also can literally overwhelm a, an investigatory office related to valid, credible evidence. Because these are courts of law, proving beyond a reasonable doubt. These aren't kangaroo courts. So uh, I'll stop here, and I apologize for kind of drifting off the reservation, but I think you kind of get the sense now that yes, we have an amazing thing going here, but that phenomenon still has to comport to, with rules of evidence. And if we can't f get that in appropriately, it's just not coming in. Therefore, I can't prove the case against these individuals. One of the things we were talking about, David, at lunch uh, a couple weeks back, a couple months back probably, was uh, I've been teaching virtual reality storytelling here at Newhouse. And uh, you had said, wow, what an, and we were talking about photogrammetry and how you could go in and take... You guys use big words over here. We don't do that in the College of Law. 10,000 10, photographs from all these angles of any scene, right? A torture chamber, a uh, crime scene of any sort. And uh, through uh, various programs, essentially, uh, you know, a jury, a judge would be able to physically walk through that scene as it was down to the millimeter, down to the centimeter mm -hmm. uh, accuracy. And you had mentioned, if we're talking about next steps, you know, how can new technology possibly pay or play a role in accountability? And uh, you know, what you know, we're talking about media and other ways we can we can leverage this. Well, I'll let, uh, I'll let Bill jump in here real quickly, but we, we can use demonstrative evidence uh, in a court to uh, allow a trier of fact to understand something. Uh, sometimes we'll take them to a crime scene, sometimes we'll take them out to a mass grave site, sometimes we'll build a, we did this in Sierra Leone where uh, Hinga Norman and the Civil Defense Force had this death camp, so we had an exact model of it put together so that we could use it when witnesses were uh, describing something, they could point to it and so the trier, it helps the trier fact understand. Statistical analysis. Exactly, same thing. But 
Uh, yes, I mean, my head exploded when you started describing that to me, because what a wonderful thing it would be is to be able to, instead of, you know, sometimes these, these crime scenes aren't available anymore. It's, they're old, they've been destroyed, uh, you know, through whatever means, jungle, uh, rot, or they've just been destroyed by uh, kinetic energy of some type of ordinance or what have you. But to be able to have had that and be able to use that evidence to walk them through it, as long as you bring in an expert in to describe that this is what we do, this is how we do it, uh, this is a depiction of these pictures which uh, are, are valid and authentic pictures or however you do it, you're still going to have to bring an expert in to explain to the court that this isn't something we made up, all right? And then we go from there. If they buy that, then we can get them to literally go through and, you know, put on the, the goggles or what have you and get them to... Uh, to understand what a what what the death chamber looked like, or particularly in Syria, uh, there may we not be able to have access to the detention facilities uh, there, but we can walk them through a torture chamber, as long as we can show them that that's an act that's the actual torture chamber. We'd have to authenticate that, and there are ways to do that. Bill. Um, how, how how blunt would you like me to be? Be blunt. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, well, I think there's two issues. Um, one, <clears throat> one David has already touched upon, and I'll start with a different one. Um, I, I've been engaged in quite a few, I've been in this field for 20 years, engaged in quite a few different uh, conflicts around the world. And, uh, um, be, and, and there's never been as much information, media and social media principally, um, regarding any any conflict as 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 this one, in in part because social media is new and and so forth. So the question is, to what degree has has the, the traditional media, social media, the, the 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 cacophony of information which is 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 available on every conceivable subject? I don't think there's any, anywhere there is a insufficient reporting on 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 the war in Syria. I, I really don't think there's any gaps. In this respect, if you want, if one wants to know about something, it can be found, and um, or you can ask. You can link to someone on this Twitter. You notice in the in the schedule today, everyone has their Twitter uh, addresses. Uh, I'm the only one without one. I've, I've only just figured out how it works. Um, yeah, you don't have one. Other, yeah, so old guys. Old guys. Yeah, old school. Um, so, so. So then the question is, at least to my mind, is to what degree has this massive availability of information and this reporting uh, by, by um, very good foreign journalists um, and indeed by um, citizen journalists, I don't know precisely the term that's used, but um, the network, for example, of the one chap from the last panel inside, and these, these men and women are getting killed uh, running around in there, killed and wounded uh, with alar at alarming rates. Does it influence uh, policy and, 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 and political decision taking? In the case of Syria, it has not. It has not at all. Clearly not. And uh, this is a, uh, if we're talking only about Syria, um, this is a, a hardcore power political uh, uh, regional conflict that is starting to have broader implications, clearly, in, in US Russian uh, relationship. And um, I'm not suggesting the citizen journalists should save themselves and, and Roy should find something else to do with his time. Um, it, it, it's, it, my point is, is it's, it's been done and it's not going to make any difference. So it's, the story is worth telling for, I, I suppose, humanitarian reasons and, and other things. But if, if you're looking, if you think more of the same is going to change the policy political calculus that is uh, informs this conflict, it's not. Um, um, it's the first job I ever had where I'm constantly with policy people and to a degree with, with Western political people. And yeah, they're, they're human beings, they're upset about the killing and stuff, but <laughs> this is not their first concern, um, uh, not at all. So, so now when we come to accountability and in particular criminal justice accountability, accountability is a terribly amorphous term. Um, David and I are in the business of, of, of criminal justice accountability, of course. Open source material, um, and, and I don't want to belabor the point that David has made, um, is very, very 
hard to transform into evidence. So um, early on when we didn't have any, uh, very much money uh, f four or five years ago, when media act, uh, human rights activists, if you will, in Syria were very active with these uh, iPhones, these smartphones, filming all kinds of stuff. So because we didn't have much money, we wrote some simple software to capture this stuff from YouTube and Facebook pages and so forth. And uh, we, we ended up five, 600,000 videos. Later, um, when we got more organized, we, we had a team, you actually hired Syrian refugees, ran it out of uh, Sofia in Bulgaria. Um, and we had everything indexed with an eye to which of this stuff might be of some use. Well, half of it straight away was, was I mean, we saved, we retain it, but it, it was jettisoned as absolute rubbish. So, and really a lot of uh, guys, some women, were, were getting hurt doing this stuff. And uh, it, they were getting hurt for, from a criminal justice point of view, and that's usually what the Syrians want. They want criminal justice. They're not interested in any abstract human rights nonsense. They, they, they want someone to be punished. It's very typical of other conflicts. It's rubbish. Half of it's rubbish. The other half has potential applications um, in terms of crime-based information, linked in particular with, with um, well, you'll have a lot of that anyway, but the, the sort of work that the Syria Accountability Project does. Um, but what we're really interested in, as I explained this morning, is linkage information. What helps us establish the responsibility of high-level perpetrators for um, the, the physical actions of others? Uh, under their authority, under their command, and um, it, you know, it's it's a bit of a, a, a fool's game. But it, we say maybe five percent. So, in absolute terms, it's not that bad. So it's not quite as bad, but it's not. Sure. So I don't know what's five twenty-five thousand out of half a million videos. Let's say may have some application in a linkage case. Um, but in and of itself, it's, it's, it would not be enough. It comes together with the traditional forms of evidence, which are docu documentation generated by the perpetrating institutions. This is always the first focus. And then witnesses, not victim witnesses, you, don't, you need very, very few wi uh, victims in a, in a war crimes prosecution uh, from, a, from a technical point of view, insider witnesses. Essentially, Invariably, they're co-perpetrators, but they're not of sufficient level that they're going to be prosecuted. So how <coughs> media, social media comes together with our work, it, it, it just, I, 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 maybe that we're too old and, and we're having still struggling to get our head around it, but we're, we think outside the box. Judges, as a general rule, do not. These are the trials of triers of fact that David referred to, judges. And uh, so, so I'm not saying stop. I think there's other applications for what you're doing. It just, I just don't see it in 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 this uh, in our area. Right. And uh, to that point, I mean, social media is a tool, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whether you know you're doing something a slightly different, like with virtual reality and 360 video and, and documenting scenes. Uh, but it's you know it's evolving and it's being applied uh, you know across the world and in, in, you know projects like in Syria, so you guys had a, have had a lot of success with that. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I have the privilege of knowing David as many of you do, and the work that he and Bill Mike, does. Mike, uh, drew the mic. Oh, oh no, the work that they do is it builds upon Robert Jackson at Nuremberg 70 years ago, coming back with the decisions, and. I think the biggest thing we can do, Ken, given all our tools, is reframe our expectations. You know, uh, through all the Abrahamic faiths, you know, we know the story of Cain and Abel. And whether you believe it to be fiction or truth or whatever, the fact is that human being three killed human being four. That's not going to change. These guys see that in graphic detail in ways that we can't imagine. But the power of this conference is that there's pushback. The, the college students that are in the audience were raised on Harry Potter. For me, and Dean in the front row, and Hub, what you're doing here, Columbia School should be doing this. The other journalism schools should be doing this. It's a way, in Harry Potter terms, of creating Dumbledore's army. <laughs> what you do matters. 
We are not gonna end war. Never again is a myth. Human beings are selfish, brutish, and all those Hobbesian truths that we know fiercely. But unless we don't reorder and reset and reconnect with each other, we don't stand a chance. So, you know, so it's a sobering truth. And I sense, Bill, and I, I just had the pleasure of meeting you here, that you, you see these uncomfortable truths. But we need to keep doing what we're doing. And that journalism between teaching and war crimes and, and journalism, uh, it, it, these stories are more important than ever. Um, so it, it's, it's a sobering concept. Um, and here's the other sobering part of it, you know, it, during the Holocaust, there were only, I think, two instances of pictures coming out or evidence. So at least our grandparents' generation had the excuse of saying, well, we didn't know, all right? And, and we know. You know, what are we doing about it? And the biggest thing, you know, to go back to the theme of this panel, if all of you took out your cell phones right now and got on your congressman's page and said, what are you doing about Syria? They'd feel some heat and move those levers of power. It may be slow, it may be cumbersome, all those things that we know, but you know, that's, that's ultimately what we need to do, that there's gotta be some pushback on the people who control power. And the, the you know, so I, I, I hope that helps here, but what I'm suggesting here is we have to reframe our, our sights um, and, and our mission. And when you say pushback, you know, what do you mean? I, you know, with pushback, I, I think that the dark forces, to go back to Harry Potter analogies, and I'm sorry <laughs> if that trivializes what we're doing here, you know, Hogwarts will be overrun. You know, we need to have those bodies there and have these, co imagine if every major journalism school in the country partnered with their political science department and had events like this, all right? So that's the pushback. Um, so it may not seem like we accomplished that much today, but we did. Thank you very much. Yes, we have a question. Mary? Is there a mic? Oh, you can grab mine. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so, um, hi. First, I want to thank you for a really stimulating day. Um, I'm Mary Lovely. I'm the chair of the International Relations Program. And I wanted to ask a question based on um, next steps. The next steps that you've been talking about are next steps having to do with prosecution. The next steps that I'm thinking about, what are the next steps for students who are very concerned, see, see the carnage, want to do something, but really don't know how to bring it into their own education. The <coughs> well, number one thing I hear from my students is that they want to do something meaningful. Some students even write meaningful in capital letters into their emails to me. <laughs> so one of the things I see from the Newhouse students is first of all, they're incredibly bright students. But second of all, they're so busy mastering their trade that I have a very hard time retaining their attention. And earlier, um, Roy said that to go into a war, war zone, you have, to, you have to have a sort of structural understanding of the situation. And what I'm concerned about is, is that journalism students never really get the training that gives them a way to think structurally about the situation. Uh, and that we're all in our little silos and that, you know, so we have tried very hard to break down those silos. That's why I'm a co-sponsor in here today and to work with, with, with <coughs> David and Ken before. But I think we have to push a little further. So particularly in terms of, you know, when we go into a region, culture, politics, history, economics, these are all very important to have an understanding. God forbid you should also speak the language. These are all kinds of things that we do in international relations. I mean, my, my training is in economics. And when I read the economics <coughs> press, I'm like, what happened? Did that reporter just pick the first study that came up on Google, which happens to be from some guy at MIT? This has happened a lot in the globalization debate. And then it just gets picked up and picked up and picked up so that anybody who writes a story has to push that button. They seem to have absolutely no other under understanding. And then the narrative is just drummed into the public without any kind of sort of questioning. So I guess my question is, how does a student build an education that makes them the type of journalist that they really want to be? That's a great question, and actually, it's on my list. <laughs> right, we have all these amazing people here with great histories. If you were 20 years old back in the day, what kind of decisions would you make? We gotta keep it short, like just a one or two sentences. I can do it for uh, 
just to pick up on a point I was making earlier, uh, I think it's a great question because it really is the question. I, I mean, the last thing I as a reader or a viewer want is the cliche about uh, ancient hatreds or whatever the hell is, you know, the, the current phrase for this. Uh, ancient, this is what we heard in the Balkans all the time, and, and it wasn't. It was ancient hatreds that were deliberately stirred up by some politician for personal gain. <clears throat> so you, you want to dispense with that. Listen, the, the most, the best education you can get at the, if you're coming into something, uh, and I I was talking to Ben earlier about how he started up in uh, in the Syria issue, is that you know you you go to this near the scene, and of course we all recommend to any budding journalist don't go to the number one issue on Earth, go to the number two or the number three and become an expert there. But anyway, it is it is to talk to real people who are fleeing the scene, <coughs> refugees. The interviews are not that hard to arrange on the whole; they're everywhere. People do not give up their livelihoods, their possessions, their friends, their homes, um, uh, you know, and their futures lightly. <clears throat> they do it only because their whole lives, have, their lives have been threatened. And you want to find out what it is precisely that led them. And then you go to another person and do, the, do it at depth, and then do another person. And you will actually thereby get an overview of what's really happened. In these cases, and there are many of them, where it, it's, it is a war crime masquerading as a war, you know, you can, you can put together that picture from, from real people, and then you can, you can you know, go back to it again and again as you actually start covering the story. So, but I think, uh, you know, just even asking the question is great because uh, it's the, it is an ultimate challenge to, to get your bearings, to get your compass, and, I, and this is one way to do it. Lee, from your perspective, you know, what would, advice would you give to young students? Well, we do a lot with um, the families of journalists in Syria who have been missing, kidnapped, or murdered. We work very closely with Austin Tice's parents, with um, the Foley family, and we, we have a fund where we raise money to support the families. And over the last year, we've worked a lot with the, the White House, the FBI. They created a, a sort of a fusion cell, they could call it, where um, we can put together all of this information in the same place. When a journalist goes missing, for example, the family has no idea what to do, where to start. And every case is different. Um, some of them can go to the media and some of them can't. Some of them, can, you know, will try to get ransom. Some of them can't. It's a very, very targeted, specific process once a journalist uh, in Syria goes missing or anywhere in the world. So um, what we do is we provide the media, we provide the support, but we need everyone else to join us in that mission to, to actually write to their congressmen, and there are some that have been more helpful than others, but it does move, it does move policy, and it does bring people home, and uh, they rely, the families of all of these of citizens, citizen journalists out there who are missing, do rely on you all reading the press releases about what may seem like a small case to you, but it's a very large case to them. And it, it is important to pay attention to individual cases as well as sort of the, the mass numbers that we're reading about that's happening in, in Syria today. Syria is ranked um, in our World Press Freedom Index as 177th out of 180 uh, countries. So it's not surprising you're not getting any, you know, a lot of Im information you can use it as evidence. But to have, a have these countries that are just completely you know, almost closed to the outside world through journalism is, is something that we, we can unite around and we can keep in mind as we, you know, become maybe focused on one area of the world or one issue, but um, you know, remain aware of, of these families and these individuals who are working in this area. Hey, Ken, I, I just yes. feel the need to respond right to ahead. Professor Lovely's Please. comment. And I share her frustration about the fact that sometimes our, it's hard to get our students' attention around some of those things. As the dean of the School of Communications, half of our students are future journalists. There's a reason that we insist that they take two-thirds of their classes in arts and sciences and that we want all of you to have a minor to focus on political science or economics or history so that you have some context for the kinds of stories that you'll one day be covering. But I know it's always more fun, <coughs> excuse me, and more exciting to do the skills. But we do want you to understand 
that there is a reason we ask you to take those other courses because you can't be the kind of journalist that we want you all to be if you're not well grounded in those other things. So I know sometimes it doesn't seem as much fun and you wonder why are we making you take all of those classes somewhere else. It's because it's important and because you will be well-rounded and you will have, be able to put the stories that you're covering and the situations that you're thrust into into perspective when you leave here. So that's why we're an accredited program. That's why arts and sciences and having minors are so important to our students. And I hope that you continue to work hard to try to get their attention because our professors think it is important. Uh, I could just jump on that very quickly. I am a Newhouse student. I'm also an arts and science student. Um, as we're supposed to minor, like she said, I'm a double major in Middle Eastern studies. I hope to report in the Middle East one day. And I would not nearly feel as comfortable as I'm beginning to feel if I weren't taking these classes. It's true, how do you, how do you expose something if you don't know the context to it, if you don't know the history behind it? And um, Newhouse does a great job of making us get that context. And I give full credit to, to Yuxil Sesgin and his Middle Eastern Studies program. It's, it's a fantastic program. But as journalists, as growing journalists, our job is no longer to document anymore. Our job is to explain, document, and give a narrative. And you need to know more than just how to write a paper to do that. And um, we, are, we are trying and we are doing it. Um, but it is hard to kind of fight the temptations of just doing what you want, but it's happening. Thanks, Elijah. Really, I'm th really thankful that you know, we have, we've had really a consistent flow of students and community members come through here today. And uh, really thankful for that. Uh, David actually uh, is gonna have a, a, a few words before we, before we close out, kind of summarizing the day and just thinking about, about, you know, why we're here. And it's, it's really about, you know, the people that are being affected by this conflict and how we can, how we can affect change uh, as part of that. Well, thank you for the privilege of getting the last word. And of course, it's an incredibly dangerous thing to give the last word to a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> But let me be brief. That was a joke. Uh, I, we don't. <laughs> a Indeed. Uh, this has been an amazing day at, at many levels, and uh, certainly I echo uh, Roy's comment. I believe it was Roy's comment that you know, uh, uh, when we have a the number one journalism school in the country bring together uh, a whole series of disciplines to talk about the role of media, social media, and how it's affecting atrocities with a case study in Syria, uh, that's a big deal, that's a big thing. It's important that we do have these discussions because it all matters, it all comes together because you can't uh, do a successful prosecution at the international level without many things to include uh, a vital uh, uh, role of media, of NGOs, of political support, what have you, in your prosecutions. And uh, we certainly use that in, in West Africa. So again, uh, we've talked about many things, and I won't go over any of those because I think we've, uh, we've uh, ha had some good discussions. But uh, remember, I, I, at the beginning of this, uh, this day, I kind of mentioned at the end of the day, and I think Ken just led it back to me again, is that this is all about human beings. And of course, it, it was really driven home to me by uh, the young seven-year-old tweeting out of Aleppo, uh, this is a human being. And there are tens of thousands of them that are affected. And so even though we have to report to, uh, as journalists or we have to uh, do our criminal investigations and we have to do our jobs related to seeking justice and reporting, what have you, we always have to remember uh, the victims of these uh, tragedies that we are working in and around. And I'll just give you, uh, as a kind of a closing, uh, my one of my experiences that brings this home, and, and, and it always, uh, I tell my students this too, because I think it's important to, to illustrate the point. I was in, uh, it was March of 2004, and I was in uh, McKinney, which was the former headquarters of the infamous Revolutionary United Front, uh, the individuals who were uh, chopping people's hands, or every, 
piece of a body that they could cut off, they were doing that. That was their method of terror. Uh, and I was in a school for, uh, for uh, uh, disabled children. Some of them had been disabled by, uh, by the RUF themselves. There were about 300, 300 of us in a room kind of the size of this. And uh, this was during one of our town hall meetings, and I would stand among them uh, and talk about, uh, listen to them ask questions. And so I was sitting there, standing there in front of uh, the group, and there's, they're all around me. And this young man stood up, and he was deaf. Uh, he had been deafened during the combat. He was, I was told later, he was a former child soldier. And he looked at me with tears streaming down his eyes, and he says, I killed people. I'm sorry, and he literally fell into my arms weeping, and of course, uh, that brought some tears from me as well, and as we sat there in the middle of this room of 300 people, both of us weeping, a young woman stood up, and she was missing half of her face, and I was told that it had been forced into a pot of boiling water uh, by the RUF a number of years ago, and she was holding her child, and she looked me dead in the, my eyes with her one good eye, and she said, seek justice for us. And so that's why we do this. And that's why I want you, I tell you this not to be overly dramatic, but I tell you this because this is about human beings and we have the privilege of reporting about it, we have the privilege of investigating it, we have the privilege of prosecuting so that these people will not, as I was talking about uh, this morning, disappear in the sands of time and nobody did anything to seek justice for them. We have to do this. So it may look bleak sometimes, but mankind has made a huge step forward. We've crossed the Rubicon back in 1993. Instead of killing tyrants who kill their own citizens, we prosecute them, starting with Yugoslavia and Rwanda and Sierra Leone and Cambodia. It's not pretty, it's not perfect, but we have made a fundamental shift in the overall geopolitical thinking that Justice does have a place at the table. It makes take some time, but justice has a place at the table. So I think that even though we're having a terrible situation in, in Syria, uh, at the end of the day, looking back 50 years from now, we will see that we've made some huge strides in modern international criminal law, of which the media can, does play an important role in this. And we've made some huge strides. We do hold heads of state accountable. We do take down their henchmen. Uh, for what they've done. And we have to keep doing that. Sometimes it's one step forward and five steps back. But again, like I said, Charles Taylor never thought he'd be held accountable for what he had done in West Africa, and he's now sitting wearing that orange jumpsuit uh, in a maximum security prison for the rest of his life in England. So we have to just keep the faith, uh, keep working together, uh, keep reporting, because the world needs to know about this. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, I think it's more of a positive uh, uh, circumstance than we uh, are kind of coming away from uh, uh, today. I don't want to belittle or disrespect what's going on in Aleppo and, and Syria, but the point is is that uh, there is a structure out there called modern international criminal law. We're good at it. If the politicians give us the case, we're going to take these guys down. And as I said to my chief investigation standing in a mass gravesite at the Savage Waters and near the diamond fields of eastern Sierra Leone, uh, I turned to him and I said, we're going to get these bastards. And we did. So keep the faith. Ken, uh, thank you to, uh, to the Newhouse uh, School of Communications. It's, it's, this is my favorite school in the... In, in the university because it is, it's dynamic, it's exciting. You guys th think good thoughts down here and new thoughts. So I appreciate the opportunity to work with you. And uh, again, thank you for coming. Thank you, David. Thanks to everybody. Um, you know, if, if it stops here, y'all, it's a failure. It's, I consider it a fail. You can't take and just go, oh, this tragedy, oh, I learned something, now I'm just gonna go have a latte and just continue on watching the Kardashians, right? We need 10,000 more cranes. We need 10,000 more Fadis. Uh, we need 1,000 more Rezes. No offense, right? <laughs> right? We, and you guys are those people. No joke. So don't, don't sit down in the face of all this. 
Take this information and go and do something about it. Do something about it. And thank you for coming. On behalf of Newhouse Center for Global Engagement, Newhouse School, and uh, our partners, uh, have a great evening. Cheers.